Welcome to the Lead More Podcast. I'm your host, John T. Meyer. The Lead More Podcast is the show where we sit down with leaders of today to help inspire and create more leaders for tomorrow, with definitely an emphasis and a focus on all different types of leaders because it's not about your background or your salary or your title or where you went to school that makes you a leader. It's about your actions. And we're showcasing all sorts of great leaders. And today, in episode 45, we're doing something for the first time. We have a return guest, someone who hasn't been with us since all the way back in episode 12, my good friend, David Whitesock. David is a person who just helps me think through topics and helps me process and always asks me really great questions. So when it came to the topic of leadership transition, I had to call him back up. So in this episode, David and I sit down and we talk about that topic. Where does this idea of leadership transition come from? How does it look in the business sense? How did it look this year in 2021 in the American presidential sense, which was pretty unprecedented? But also, where does that come from? David wrote his um, master's research on Thomas Jefferson. He's a pro on Thomas Jefferson. So we look all the way back to America's very first president and how leadership transition looks. So a little bit of a different episode, but a really great conversation. I think you're going to enjoy it. Episode 45, David Whitesock. All right. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of the Lead More podcast. The first time we're bringing back a guest, a former guest. I don't remember what episode number you were, David, but... uh... Welcome back to the show, David Whitesock. Hey, thanks, John. This is a uh, this is an honor. I really don't feel like uh, I should be the one with this honor at all. <laughs> well, I think it's it's uh, one thing. I'm I'm I don't know if I really have my finger on it yet, but watching like the uh, the listener count or the episode play count is really interesting. And I haven't quite figured out is it you know did I market that one better? Did I write a better catchier headline? Was it just the person the guest? And so like one thing, I think we went, you're the first episode where we went over an hour and actually the play count is a little bit lower on your episode. Uh, and I don't know if that's just like people see that and they're like, I don't, I don't have time for an hour, <laughs> but um, I feel like more people need to hear from you and I knew you're the pers- perfect person for this conversation. So for lead more listeners who have listened to uh, other episodes, that was redundant, um, th- we're going to do something different. And I want to talk about the topic of leadership transition. So you ready for that? Let's do it. Yeah, this is going to be great. Cool. So why why that topic? It's pretty hot on my mind. Uh, as listeners know, uh, Amy and I sold our company in January about 60 days ago. And uh, I have a job for about nine more months and then have to success. A big part of my job this year is to make a successful leadership transition. Uh, so that was top of mind. And then, of course, in January, we, wish, we witnessed it on the national level with the political uh transition that was pretty unprecedented, I would say, from our, our country's history. Uh, and that's where I want to start with you, because you are a, uh, a scholar, a historian. You did your PhD on Thomas Jefferson. Um, not, a, so, not, a, not a PhD, a master's. Oh, sorry. A master's. Thanks. for. Come on, I'm hyping you up. Uh, uh, that's fine. I'll, I'll, I'll take your honorary PhD. Bring it on. <laughs> okay. Well, let's start there. Like what, uh, I guess I'll let you decide where we want. Do you want to start with just sort of the origin of the idea of like a peaceful transition of power? Yeah. You know, every time we have a presidential election and we talk about the peaceful transition, you, you turn on the news and you hear people like um, John Dickerson from CBS or uh, John Meacham, you know, on, on NBC and MSNBC talk about how completely incredible uh, a, a peaceful transition for a country was at that time. So just remember what was going on, you know, 1776 to 1800, you know, you had countries collapsing or, or transitioning through war. That's how it was done. The French Revolution, right? Yeah. The French Revolution was blood in the streets, Robespierre, you know, and, and everybody just, it, it was whoever could survive would take over the next version of France. Yeah. And the United States had a little bit of that, right? Of course, with about six or seven years of the American Revolution, but once you get to a stable government and it's a democracy or a republic, a democratic republic, how does that continue? Right? That's something sure. different. It wasn't, that wasn't in the lexicon then. 
And so for George Washington to say, there's nothing written in the rules, mm-hmm. but I'm only going to do this twice. I'm stepping aside. You all figure out who's next under this rule book. That just, was, that just wasn't done. Yeah. Hey, it could have been King Washington, right? Many thought he was king, right? Sure. I mean, the way, depending upon um, who you read or what you read, you know, history is sort of written by the players at the time Mm -hmm. um, and those that come after that have an agenda and those that come way after who don't have an agenda, but want to try to understand. And and there was a segment who looked at George Washington um, as just sort of a pseudo king, right? Hmm. Um, Still kind of a monarchical kind of figure, an aristocrat. He was tall, very stately. Um, he dressed a bit like a king. Um, he wasn't a, a man of the people. You know, skip ahead two presidents, and you have Thomas Jefferson, who if you walked into the White House uh, while he was there, he'd be wearing his pajamas, and he'd greet you in his slippers, or not greet you at all, <laughs> because he, he, didn't, he didn't feel the need to be bothered. Sure. And because he didn't put himself up onto a, a pedestal in that way. Now you could read another uh, biographer and, and someone will say, well, that was just Jefferson, um, you know, playing a bit of a fool because sure. he was, he was smart like that. Super smart. Yeah. Well, it's one thing when you look at, you know, in the modern era and you have 200 plus years of history, tradition, precedence, this kind of like we've created this persona of what a president should be like and should do. And, you know, in many ways, the last four years were, kind of everything the opposite of that, which, which really ruffled a lot of feathers. Um, but for Washington to do it when, like you said, there was no rule book, there was no tradition, there was no precedent. Like he could have done it. And then Adams right after him could have just said, Nope, I disagree. <laughs> and then, and then the whole two term thing is gone. Right. Well, you know, it, it's interesting that you mentioned Adams because um, he was a very polarizing figure, you know, a little bit where Washington kind of wanted Washington was, was, a hardcore federalist, but he really wanted to have an America that worked for everybody. Mm -hmm. Um, Adams was not that way. Adams was, uh, you know, the alien sedition acts. You will fall in line. You will believe this. You will say these things. You will, this is America. Mm -hmm. And of course, Thomas Jefferson, you know, you didn't run for president. So in 1796. um, Yeah, because Adams is only one term. So really like the two term thing didn't get tested until Jefferson. Correct. Yeah. But, it, you know, when, when Adams won in 1796, his next closest running mate was Thomas Jefferson. Mm-hmm. You know, you had, so today we have a Democratic president and a Democratic vice president. Well, in 1796, you had a Federalist president and a Democratic and runner up. Yeah. vice president. Well, uh, when that election was held, it's a really interesting story that we don't hear much about. Jefferson wrote Madison, uh, uh, James Madison, and said, I want to congratulate Mr. Adams. And here's my letter that I want to send him and and tell him, I know we're divided, um, but I I, I support you. And and James Madison said, no, you will do nothing of the sort. He wasn't like, dude, just text him. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it took it took months before you know letters a got letter, to letter. Yeah, but the idea was that that Jefferson really kind of wanted to have this because um, he was a romantic. He kind of believed yeah. in this this peaceful transfer, but Madison was more political, more eyeballing. Okay, what's next? This is a weak figure. Don't give him more to his ego. Um, you just wait because you'll be president in eighteen hundred anyway. Yeah, I wanted to ask you that because there was sort of a, I get the vibe and you know much better than me from a historical context, but when we think about founding fathers, and I guess I don't know always who we consider in that bucket and who we don't, but it definitely seemed like there was like a pecking order, like, okay, wait your turn, like Madison, you'll be next, and then and then Monroe, and, and is, was that how it was? It seems that way. Yeah, and it's always been that way, right? Um, <laughs> not to ruffle too many feathers, but we're seeing it right now in Republican politics, uh, who is going to be next? And they're lining yeah. up the Nikki Haley's of the yeah. world and the Christy Gnomes of the world. They're all yep. sort of figuring out 
who gets the crown next um, because they've done the work. <laughs> I say this lightly. They've done the work, uh, whatever, <laughs> whatever sure, that means. Sure. The, p- um, the pot, the positioning, they played the game. Yeah. Whatever. Yeah. Yeah. But that, I mean, that's, we see that in companies too, right? Hmm. Uh, in larger companies, you, you have people working through the, 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 the line and jockeying for position to be as close to the CEO or as close to certain board members. Um, maybe it's not about metrics. It's not about performance. Mm. It's mm. about what relationships that I build so that when this CEO decides that they're going to call it quits, the board is looking to me that I am yeah. right there next. And I'm curious what, so then when that doesn't happen, like if the, if the, the precedence gets broken or even in like, I think in the, in your business analogy is a great point. There's sort of this, like, there's the natural, like, okay, this guy's pegged as number two, or this woman is going to be the run, like the next person. And, and you see it. And then there's those rare moments where like, there's the 180 shift and the dark horse candidate or someone from the outside or, and it, that seems to be when an organization decides we need like a culture shift or we need something different for a different time. Um, do we have like historical context of that too, where that, that norm was broken and the country needed something different? I mean, even it seems like Obama would be a little bit like that. Obama is interesting case because um, especially in the context of today with a lot of the racial challenges that we have, I think if you think back to, was it 2008? Mm-hmm. Um, it felt like we were on the precipice just because uh, 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 you know, Gen Xers and Gen Z was really sort of figuring out what is kind of the future of America going to look like. It's going to look not like the you know forty two other or forty three other white dudes. Yeah, it's going to be something different. And there was this sort of this very um, very quick transition to something like Barack Obama. Mm -hmm. And I think what we're seeing now, uh, so Jefferson's language would be um, agonizing spasms. Okay. Um, Again, I'll take us back to to 1800. Uh, The the trick or the challenge then was um, Jefferson and in his ilk looked at the, the eight or 12 years of the Federalists as being chaos. As, as being uh, uh, moving apart from the first principles of the country. So Adams was that disruptor. Mm-hmm. And Jefferson was like, no, um, disruption's bad for our country. We already did that. Yeah, we yeah, already yeah. did the disruption. What we need is calm. We need, um, we need to move forward incrementally and change. Jefferson was a, a, a pure incrementalist. And, and when we think about him and slavery, he was like, we're not going to solve this in my time. I'm yeah, sorry. Yeah. You won't do it. It will come later. And I think Barack Obama was that it will come later. Hmm. But it didn't stick. And I don't know why. I think that that sort of gets back to what's hiding underneath the surfaces that we, we haven't fully embraced about culture. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't know if... Uh it's touched every episode. So we'll talk about it now too, but the pandemic, you know, we talked about it being an accelerant and really moving forward change that was already happening and just making it go faster. But also I think a, a little bit of a um, ex- ex- exposure, like we ex- expose things that we thought maybe we had taken care of or, or maybe been, you know, complete that clearly weren't right. So racial injustice and uh, healthcare inequality, and, and it just exposed a lot of things that we need to fix. Um, and I think that's that's where do you feel like then it's a pretty loaded question, but is two terms, is eight years the right amount? Like is that the right time to create impact and change? And maybe it's fresh on my mind. I just finished Obama's book. And you kind of forget how much of it is timing in terms of do you have the window to actually create change within the democratic system in terms of, you know, balance of powers and 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 who which party is in control in the House and the Senate. What do you think about that? Was two terms the right amount? This, I think, is the critical um, conversation to have because it might not be about the length of years. I think the reason why you framed it up the way you did was because we have this hard swing of pendulums going back and forth 
um, somebody comes in and they just knock down all the walls and they put up, you know, new walls. <laughs> not even, not even <laughs> literally, somebody was putting up new walls um, and new drapes and all of that stuff, right? They just knock down the things before and they try something new. Then the next guy comes along or gal comes along. And what was the first thing that, that President Biden did? He wrote a whole bunch of executive orders to undo what the previous mm-hmm. president did. That's not sustainable. Yeah. You know, so what, what I, when, I, when I hear you sort of frame it up that way, what it tells me is we don't have a North Star. We yeah. don't, we don't uh, collectively, as a, as, a, as a people, as a citizenry, we don't understand what our first principles are. We don't know where our values are aligned so that we can all be shooting that same direction. We're not going to agree on everything, but we all know that we want to get to some place that's the same place. Right now, yeah. we're, we're, in, we're in 100 different boats and some of us have oars and some of us don't. Yeah, we each have a map going somewhere different. Yeah, Or no map at all, probably, yeah. <laughs> right. So what is there, let's go back to Jefferson then. Is there something that you, and I think you made an interesting comment about like the agenda or a historian still have like an agenda when we write about, you know, and recognizing that history is also within the lens of the context of the time. Um, Were there things that Jefferson did well or not well in terms of the, of the spirit of transition of of power? What did, was there things he laid on the seeds he laid or, or best practices he started that kept that, or not even really kept that started that tradition. When he came into office, um, the country was in, in significant debt, right? Okay. We were coming out of the revolution. Um, there was still lingering issues or challenges with the British. Um, we were in debt, significant debt. And what he did is he erased it. Um, so over the course of eight years, he was able to eliminate the national debt. And that set the next couple of presidents up on a really good footing for figuring out, so what do we do when we don't have these chains upon us as a country? Because when you think about taxation, why do we tax? We tax because um, either it, it's to get something done, it's to redistribute something to help people. That's how we think about it today. If you go back to then, it was, well, we're still trying to build a country. Yeah. Yeah. We need roads. <laughs> infrastructure, yeah. We need infrastructure. We need to get the mail um, from one place to the next on horse and buggy. Uh, <laughs> how, how do we do that? Um, we, have, we, we, we can't have debt because debt won't allow us to get there, which is interesting because Jefferson died with incredible debt, right? He, he, he personal lived debt. personal debt. He lived way beyond his means. Um, he had a spending budget, it, uh, whether people know this or not. Every president was given, at least in the early days, $25,000. That was their salary. But they had to also spend that money on their state dinners, their staff. It, sure, things weren't paid for them, yeah. You know, and, and so Jefferson would order crates of wine and, and just go way beyond his means, right? Um, and, and, and that's the way he lived. So, but but that, how he lived his personal life was different than the way that he lived his public servant life. And it was to set a strong foundation. Now, good leaders get that. They don't, um, I think I heard somebody say, and I'm going to, I don't, I won't be able to place this right. But, uh, you know, Wayne Gretzky is, is famous for saying this. You don't pass the puck to where the person yep. is. You pass it in front. Um, uh, people Stay who where do, it's going, yep. Yeah, people who do, um, uh, who shoot targets, they don't shoot at the target. They're looking at something beyond the target, right? They want the bullet to pass through a place to get to another spot. Really good presidents do that. And I think that's what Jefferson was, was attempting to do. Um, James Madison, who came after him, was trying to do that. It got mucked up when John Quincy Adams came into office because now politics was getting a little bit more fractious, hmm. which is the way it is today. So yep. presidents today are, are really struggled to be able to do that. I think Barack Obama was trying to do that. George Bush may have been trying to do that, the second one, mm-hmm. a little bit, um, but obvious off, off of a new context of terrorism. Yeah. Uh, it, that's just really hard. So it's always, where am I going to pass the puck? 
Yeah, and it's that feel, you, you made that thing about how he set up with the debt, how he set up the, those to follow him quite nicely. Like, what if even with the two party system and, and varying uh, opinions on how to solve problems, what if that was the goal, right? Like, I wanted to lay the foundation so the person after me can do more, even if they get credit for it, right? Like, that to me is a strong leader instead of this feeling of, okay, we'll spend the first year just rewriting and, and br- rolling back everything from the previous four years. It's just two steps forward, three steps back, you know? It's, it's you know, it, which is really, um, I almost wonder if we wouldn't be a better country if we went back to a popular election of, 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 of a president and then separately of a popular election of a vice president. Hmm. And, and, and if it was divided and we had a Republican and Democratic vice president and president, they would be forced to Work show together. up as stewards to do something together. Now, now maybe, just maybe, that doesn't, doesn't go well. <laughs> <laughs> um, but again, I'm also a romanticist. And, 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 and an it's going to go worse, right? <laughs> it, it, it can't get worse than what, what we have today. So what we have today exactly. is we have somebody like President Biden who chooses – Kamala Harris, which is a great choice when you think long-term and succession planning. Yeah. Um, he's assuming that the future of the country is going to look a lot more like a Kamala Harris, not necessarily politically, but culturally. I um, hope so. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, Peter Drucker, um, you know, is, is, he's got you know, one of his famous quotes is um, uh, succession planning often results in uh, the selection of a weaker representation of ourself. And that's a warning. It's a warning to say, you have to, you have to step way outside of yourself to figure out who's next. If you just pick somebody that's like, like you, it won't be you. And it's going to make your company, your organization, your community worse off. Yeah. I like that. And I've been using the line internally in, in, in our context of like, you know, we actually, you know, the, the answer of who's the next leader at Lemonly is we don't know right now. Like we truly don't know. And that's a conversation that we have to figure out in the walls of Lemonly, in the walls of ClickRain and jointly together. And, but one thing I do know is like, nobody should try to be John and not because I'm like irreplaceable. I'm not, I don't, I don't, my, my ego's not that big, but like, it just doesn't work right to try to like be a copy of somebody or to replicate when you when no single person is the same. Right. And so how do you uniquely, and so maybe that's the opportunity in leadership transition. We want some foundation and continuity, but how do we then let the next person shine in their own way? Right. Yeah. It's interesting. Um, you painted a vision, right. Of, of what Lemon Lee is. How far did that vision go? How far could you see into the future? Yeah, and I think so, I think that's a great question because sometimes I think that might have been part of what nagged at me and eventually deciding that moving on was the right thing because I don't know if I had another vision or another 20 years worth of vision, right? And I always felt that as an inadequacy of a leader is like, what does this thing look like? You know, like some people would ask me like, do you think Margo, my five-year-old, will, will take over the, the the family business? And I was like, family business? Like, <laughs> It's not, it's going to be done in 10 years. You know, like I just honestly kind of thought that way. Right. Like it. And so like, I would never, never fathom the idea of my five-year-old taking over Lemonly. And so I didn't know if that was a fault of me as a leader or just that there was a, a fixed time horizon. You know, it's a great question. I asked that question because I was really fortunate when I, um, when I joined Face It Together uh, in Sioux Falls, um, the two co-founders were polar opposites. Uh, mm-hmm. Kevin Kirby and, and Charlie Day were were on other ends of the coin in the way that they thought about business, the way that they thought about organizations. Um, but they also had an alignment of, of governance um, and, and how, and of course, good to great was kind of our Bible. Sure. They were two different people on, on two different seats in the bus, exactly where they needed to be. But one of, and I got to sit in one of those other seats and just sort of watch and learn from mm-hmm. their experience and I asked the question I asked you is because that came up often. It was, they could only see so far, but what they did was they chose people like me and like Erica Bachelor and Jim Sturdivant, people, you know, people in, that people might know in Sioux Falls who, yeah. who saw different futures, right? Kevin could only see so far. 
So, but Erica could see differently and further. Mm -hmm. And I'd be over there. I'd be like, no, 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 we're going even further than that. (laughs) Yeah. And and that's what you need. If you're really thinking strongly about what does the future of this organization look like, put people around you who are going to see beyond what you can see and get really comfortable knowing you can only see so far. Yeah. And be okay with that. That's phenomenal. Uh, We talked, we'll get close to the end here. I know you got to go. Um, we talked before we hit record about um, Hamilton, which I know we're both fans of. Uh, it's my favorite song in the show when Christopher Jackson, who plays Washington, talks, sings about this idea of like p- peacefully transitioning the power and, and that history has its eyes on you. And so he asked Hamilton to write this memo or write this letter on his behalf. He talks about, you know, sitting under the fig tree and, and, and enjoying his days as, at, at the end of life. And, and that we talk about romanticizing leadership transition like that's that song no doubt so do you feel uh that that can exist like is there hope for that concept or is leadership transition just always going to be messy oh i don't think it has to be messy okay we get to make these choices right um that's that's a choice so whoever the leader is of the organization um they're making that conscious choice I think as more organizations, um, you know, just watching what you and, and what, what Lemony's Lemony's doing in its transition, that's an interesting marriage that's thinking about not just today and not thinking about something that's going to be messy, but that's going to be a much more robust and, and less chaotic uh, presentation of something new mm-hmm. in Sioux Falls, in South Dakota, in the industry. That's not messy at all. It probably felt messy. You were making the sausage for months. Sure. Yeah. On the surface, at, at, at the end of the day, it's going to be pretty smooth. The rest of us looking from the outside are going to go, wow, that was really well done. Um, so that, but it all comes down to intentionality. It comes down to um, not feeling like it's urgent and just being diligent. Do everything with intentionality. You'll find some mess in there, but um, again, I'm gonna you know I'll go back to Jim Collins. You know, he talks about level four, level five. You know, yeah. if if you're at level five, you'll win. If it's a bunch of level four egocentric folks, uh, the hedgehog is going to work. die. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It was the hedgehog and the fox, right? The hedgehog and the fox. Yes. So I, yeah, I think you're, you're, you ask a really good question. You know, Hamilton is an interesting figure if we just think about history. Because why wasn't he president? Why didn't well, Because he... it's random rule, right? Yeah. I mean, well, of course, he, have... he wasn't a citizen. Or, or he, wasn't, he couldn't be. Yeah, yeah. He couldn't be. But why couldn't somebody like him? Right? Sure. Would, would the country have been better? I don't know but we're still living with his fiscal economic system. You know, so I'm kind of sort of glad that we didn't have him as a president, Mm -hmm. right? You can kind of look back and go, he was in the right seat on the bus at the right time. Yeah. Yeah. And you could play a real fun kind of like choose your own adventure. What if game, if you start moving some of those pieces around and think about if this person was president or when, like what era they were president in, and you, and you can do that for companies too, right? Um, I think, uh, I forget the name, but, you know, GM went through a, a massive, uh, or yeah, sorry, Jack General, Welsh, maybe? General Electric, pardon me, you know, GE, went, yeah. went through a big transition change between two CEOs and the second CEO was a disaster. Um, and I, I get, his name is escaping me, but he's got a book out now. And he basically says, look, um, I think we did some, some things right but the transition from a heavy egocentric company and leader before to me with an, uh, with an equal ego <laughs> created challenge. Mm-hmm. Um, so you, 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 that's a huge scale, but just think about what that might be for your mom and pop shop. Sure. If, if you look down the line at your kids and go, I'm trying to teach my son or my daughter, you know, the best values in life, but I just don't think they're going to be a good one for the business. Yeah. You get to make that choice. That's a tough question. Yeah. Tough question to have. Yeah. And I think about a line that when I just finished Obama's book, he talks about like wondering, I think he was talking about foreign policy and just wondering how much of his presidency was, was him 
like his unique talents and ability to create change and leadership and how much was just the moment of the era and the time and things much more macro and out of his control. And he said that like, you know, a lot of presidents kind of in the rearview mirror, think about that. Like, would that have happened anyway? Or did I have the ability to uniquely create, you know, change? So, yeah, I mean, uh, president George Bush couldn't have fathomed his entire presidency was about terrorism. Mm-hmm. Right. That's not what it was when, when he was elected. <laughs> yeah, the yeah, country was plan. going through a transition of compassionate conservatism and he was trying to bring that along and all of a sudden um, compassion was taken away from us uh, yeah. for a lot of reasons. So yeah, I mean, we, we, we show up in the moment and the moment comes sometimes comes to us. Um, presidents are a unique lot, but I, we, to, to go back to the beginning, I want a president who is going to be there thinking about the next 20 years and starting to line up people um, who, who can help fill in that vision, uh, whether they're from their party or not. That's, that's the tricky point. Can they find mm-hmm. folks who are outside their party um, who think differently and be okay with it? If we could get there, I think we're going to be in a great place <laughs> <laughs> for your kids and mine. Well, let's end there. This was fun. We could easily go another hour, I'm sure, talking about this. But uh, this is a fun format, and I loved, you know, bringing the historical context. So thanks for sharing about Jefferson and all of the, some of our other great leaders. So thanks, thanks, David, for coming on. Thanks, John. Grateful and uh, uh, just a pleasure. All right. You be well. Take care. And that was episode 45 about leadership transition. My friend, David Whitesock, if you liked that episode, Go to iTunes and give us a five-star review, thumbs up, leave a comment, ask a question. We love that. It really helps people find the episode and find the show. So really appreciate that. Remember, we drop new episodes every Thursday, wherever you listen to podcasts, or you can go to www.leadmorepodcast.com. Take care and be well.